Um, and so the, all the kind of first generation issues that come along with that. You, you know, you simply can't, you simply can't um, think you can sort of wipe the slate, wipe, you know, 15 years of experience clean, start over and not have any problems. Um, that said, uh, I don't know that I would. I, I don't know that I would have changed the approach. Um, I think that uh, it's been beneficial to us. I think it's an inevitable direction for for the future. Uh, and so I think it was it was the right choice, even though it's been a difficult road. Um, well, why don't I show you really quick um, a brief video? Uh, there won't be any sound. Uh, hopefully, you guys can see this. Um, if not, let me paste the link in for you and you can watch it at your own leisure. So, okay, we're, this is not awesomely fast. Um, well, let me just sort of show you, kind of talk over what, what you see here. This is a um, a video of the of our tools actually running. Um, let me pause it here for a second. Um, you can see that it's running in Chrome. Um, one of one of the decisions that we made fairly early on was to pick a single browser um, that we would work with, uh, rather than trying to make it cross browser compatible and do, deal with all the issues that typical web developers have to deal with. Um, so we picked Chrome um, largely because uh, sort of we see the direction that Google is is working in and that they tend to be one, both more standards compliant with, with WebKit, um, as well as uh, pushing the edge on uh, extensions and interesting things that we could potentially take, take advantage of. Um, so it seemed like a good match for, for what we wanted to do. So yes, we do make everybody use Chrome in order to use the, the tools application. Um, so you can see it's made up of basically different, some different panels. Um, it has a fairly traditional layout. Um, the 3D window here is is uh, actually a custom plugin. Um, so that is a plugin that runs our native engine running um, and just pulls it up and embeds it into the into the window. Um, that plugin is itself a, a web server, so that the the tools, um, the UI inside the browser can actually also talk directly to that plugin. Um, these panels are all um, in the HTML UI. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about sort of the path we went to get there, but right now uh, this is all very sort of, you would recognize it as normal web application kind of um, uh, code. This is all done in HTML and JavaScript, uh, and uh, it's the, you know, the layout is pretty standard. So we have sort of global buttons up here, and these, these buttons and settings sort of are specific, more specific to this 3D view, and properties panels and all various panels come up over here. Um, and I'll, I'll pass out these links to the videos uh, a bit later. Um, so uh, one of the things, so I want to talk about a little bit is uh, why did we move in this direction? Uh, one is I felt that the, this was sort of the technical direction that things were going. Um, and that it was, I think it's an inevitability that we'll, that we'll be moving to web applications more and more, not just in game development, but in, in development in general. I, I think that we can look to um, what Microsoft's doing with Windows 8 Metro um, uh, as an example of that direction. Um, I think that the expectations of our players um, in sort of living in a uh, web application world now uh, is that we, you know, we understand the space. But I also think that the, as, peop, as we're getting sort of a new generation of game developers coming into development, this is the space that they grew up in as well um, and over the last, you know, 10 years. And that will become more and more true. And so their expectations as well as sort of the tools that they can work with will all be that these things online can all interconnect with each other. And that's not a space that we can, we can ignore. Um, we have to recognize that, that um, sort of this sandbox of, of a native application that doesn't actually communicate to anything else very well, and certainly can't take advantage of all the new online tools as they as they come up, um, is a a poor design for a lot of people from a, the perspective of a lot of people. Um, also, I think that this builds sort of necessary skills. As I said, I think the world is changing. These are things that we're going to have to learn and know. 
Um, Insomniac in particular, we've created a group called Insomniac Click that's that's largely focused on sort of the more social games. Um, and you know, these are all skills that we need to know as part of that. Um, so it's it, you know, I don't believe really in the sort of hard separation that exists right now between sort of on the online gaming space, like say social gaming space, and console gaming space. I believe these are all really part of one space and just represent different you know different platforms or parts of that. Um, so I think as game developers and you know and engine programmers or programmers, um, these are just all of these skills are things that we need to understand and know and be able to apply. Um, so being able to test this out in a fairly safe way in our in our production environment. Um, I think it's beneficial for us. Um, from a practical point of view, uh, doing it as a web application forces a kind of data division. Um, it forces us to 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 have the the view of the of the data, the the, the presentation of the of the data, um, very uh, very different or apart from uh, the back end management or, or transformation of that data to one form from one format to another, um, and. In tradition, you know, in our traditional apps, especially looking at our sort of old tool base um, and how that evolved over time, um, one of the things that certainly would come up is, you know, people would hack into it because the data was available in a native application. People would just hack into it and make a quick change here and there, and one at a time. That doesn't represent any kind of problem. But over the course of many years, those things get built up, um, and you end up with um, sort of this data spaghetti, right, where a lot of things are are transforming and changing data that really shouldn't. Uh, and it becomes very difficult to, to edit and, and modify, um, and the complexity level goes up significantly. We're having sort of a front end that's completely divided, um, even though in principle you could do it in a native application, forcing it so that it simply cannot be any other way is advantageous. Um, UI development cost is, of course, an issue. It's something to consider. Um, and, uh, you know, the cost, the, the cost of sort of working in, the practical cost of working in HTML and JavaScript um, is in practice lower than the practical cost of working in, say, WX widgets or some other native um, uh, native code base uh, for UI. Uh, one, there's simply a lot more people that can that can work with it, um, and two, uh, sort of the quick and dirty version, just to be able to get something up, um, the overhead cost of just being able to get something up is very low. Um, to the extent that uh, we can certainly trust that uh, you know pretty much anybody that can make a web page can make uh, some tools UI, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so that uh, that leaves it open to a lot of people who who wouldn't necessarily traditionally have been uh, have been able to make uh, a UI for some new aspect of the tools, um, including uh, programmers outside of the engine team or uh, technical artists or whoever. Um, it's also, I think, a you know, it's something. It's sort of a commodity tech, right? It's something that we have to look at. Um, there's a lot of availability of things that are that we ought to be able to use. You know, if we want to do something like um, integrating um, integrating online logins like Facebook or something like that into the tools for some reason, that tech is available, um, and there's a lot more that we can use. This is sort of when we start to sort of see all the new tech that's being built. Um, and all the stuff that's going on online, and all the the cool sort of very cool things that are happening in the web application space, we want to be able to take advantage of that. Um, and it's very difficult to do if uh, you aren't running in a web application. Um, anybody that's done the sort of Facebook or Twitter integration in a native client app can tell you it's significantly more complicated than doing it in a web app. Um, uh, so one of the questions we sort of we want to ask is, what do we do? You know, as game developers, right? And we sort of reflect expectations, and and this as a general rule, right? And the expectations of people, of not just our players, but our developers, are that we live in sort of this web world. It's you know, uh, I had to step back a couple of years ago and say, you know what? Um, having lived in this sort of very native, very console sandbox for quite a long time, I had to step back and say, you know what? This internet thing, probably not a fad. It's probably not going anywhere. Um, so uh, you know, how can we really embrace it? Um, and as game developers, you know, what do we do? We deal with change. That's our main, uh, that's really our main skill. Every other skill is um, going to be out of date tomorrow. Um, but dealing with change, adapting to change, that's really the thing that we do, and this is just one more aspect of that. Um, you know, we enable expression as a rule, right? We enable player expression. We enable our, our, our production teams to express themselves through our engine. Um, 
And, and I think that's a lesson we can, we can really take from the web as well. I mean, that's really the success of the web, is that's enabled all these people to express themselves. Um, and uh, we can take that lesson and apply it to our own, our own tool base uh, using the same technology. Um, so, you know, in the future, uh, you know, we want to certainly want to see a lot more custom tools, you know, a lot more plugins. So WordPress is a great example of that kind of infrastructure and ecosystem being built. Um, and certainly we would like to see that kind of same kind of ecosystem being built on, on our own platform. Um, you know, and one of the things we want to do is be able to enable surprise, which means, you know, as game developers, we want to do this in general. And, and, and doing something in a web application, because new things are appearing every day uh, in the web space, this allows us to integrate, potentially integrate those new things into the tools and just to test and see how they go. Um, and surprise our production team with cool things. If, you know, if it comes up. Um, but sort of what else? Um, as I mentioned, it's not a mature platform, right? Uh, there's still a lot of lessons to learn. There's still a lot of difficulties to solve. There's a lot of problems in building a tool as a web application that you simply don't have in a native application. Um, so these are things that you'll have to deal with as part of the process. Certainly, we've had to deal with it, and we don't have solutions to them all. Um, but, that, you know, for me, the answer to that is really, so what? It's not a mature platform. Um, you know, there are... We, you know, we push the space. This is what we do as game developers. People are certainly pushing HTML5 games out today, um, even though you know it's really it would be you'd be really hard pressed to say that HTML5 is you know ready for games, um, especially considering the audio situation there. Uh, but it's uh, it's still worth pressing, and uh, that's what we do, right? Um, Another sort of big issue is that we don't have enough experience in this. You know, we've built up our experience as engine programmers in particular, but as game developers and console developers in an entirely different space. But you know what? Well, we'll deal with it. We'll just learn as we go. That's what we do uh, with everything. Um, you know, it's better to do it now. It's better to learn these things now um, than five years from now. Because honestly, five years from now, you'll be much, much further behind the curve. Um, so anyway, the point is I'm not really trying to convince you at all. Um, uh, I just think it's inevitable. I think it will happen. You know, all these tools, everything that we're going to do are going to be web apps eventually. Um, so it's better just to do it now, just to sort of bite that bullet, learn how to learn how it's done, learn those lessons, and just do it. Uh, in much the same way that it was inevitable that we would go to um, multi-core and multi-threading, uh, and that those were things that we might, you know, we sh we should have learned then, and quite a lot of people sort of waited until. Uh, it bit them in the ass, and it was much too late or much too complicated or much more costly to make the transition. Um, so it's just better to see the writing on the wall and move forward. Um, so what's the basic structure um, of our, of our uh, application in particular? Um, so let me give you just sort of an overview. We have an at what we call an asset database, um, uh, which is a literal database running on the individual's machine. Um, so to be clear, the, there's a web server running on each individual's machine, um, and that server is driven by um, a, um, a very cool open source uh, code called Mongoose, which is sort of a web server. Um, it's sort of a one file web server, which is very cool. Um, and uh, we also use MongoDB for our AssetDB, which is also running on uh, uh, the user machine. MongoDB is a, a NoSQL sort of database, a schemaless database. Um, which uh, fits sort of our method really well. We use JSON for our asset descriptions, um, so there's no schema, and they can have sort of different fields and things, um, arbitrarily different fields depending on the situation. Uh, so a NoSQL database sort of fits, up, fits our methodology fairly well. Um, anyway, those asset files, the asset database is sort of live in memory. It's backed up by, by literal asset files um, stored on disk, which are checked into perforce in, much the, in, in very much the traditional way. Um, Part of our transition, sort of part of our move from old style to new style, was really sort of to leverage um, some of the, you know some of the approaches that we've had before. It would be much too much too difficult to try and change everything at once, um, up to and including changing the fact that we check in asset files and the perforce and how we manage that. So we really wanted to sort of keep that back in very much the same. And so we put this intermediate layer where you know you check out from perforce uh, through through a tool button, um, and then as those things are uh, propagated on your disk, the asset DB recognizes them in, and then propagates the in-memory version of the, of the, uh, of the assets. Um, so those assets point to source files. The source files are actually the things that uh, um, they, they export out of different, different programs like um, uh, PNGs coming out of Photoshop or 
um, D or Colada files coming out of uh, Maya. <coughs> so these are the source files are not actually stored in our RSDB, but just referenced. Um, we have what we call a file tracker, um, which is an NTFS journaling system, sort of watching the the, the changes on the drive. Um, so it sees what files have changed, and then uh, you know lets the asset database know that hey, these files have changed, uh, and so if the, those things can be built automatically uh, if if any asset file has changed, it's just in the background. Um, so we, and we have a build manager that manages that process. Uh, so if it sees that a file has changed, it automatically builds it uh, so that it's ready to go whenever the the whenever anybody needs to, to view it. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a local server which is sitting on that machine, which is pointing to the asset database. Um, in that local server, pretty much everything is a sort of a, a pseudo RESTful interface. Um, it runs. We run everything through uh, in HTTP API. Um, I know if you had seen uh, John McCutcheon's presentation yesterday, he had talked about his his method is to use the web sockets um, <coughs> to use web sockets to communicate between the UI and the server. And what that's certainly one of the things that we've been discussing and we've played with. Uh, but certainly that was a very rough web sockets was very rough when we started, um, and a rest. Uh, RESTful API is definitely uh, sort of a tried and true method uh, and uh, a fairly low risk kind of design. So that's what we went with. We've of course had to deal with the issues of latency um, and sort of uh, throughput, sort of two-way communication throughput as part of that decision. Uh, but it has, but it's been something that we have been able to deal with. <coughs> um, so our UI is HTML and JavaScript script largely. Um, the scene editor, as I mentioned, is a native plugin. Uh, we also have scripts that can be run uh, all, basically just from anywhere that can talk to the local server directly and skip the UI. Um, they can also be run as, as CGI, so if you want to run, um, if you just call a script in the normal CGI method uh, through the local server, you can have a script run. Um, we largely do that in particular to, uh, to manage Perforce integration, so Perforce checkout and check-in and, and uh, status and things can be done through CGI scripts from, from the UI. Um, we also have scripts that manage version conversion automatically, so if a new version is, a new version of an asset is created, meaning the actual description of the asset version changes, uh, so then we put, we have version update script that we add, um, so then whenever somebody opens a file that's in an older version, it automatically updates that and automatically updates it on read so that the newer version is available to the database and the whole UI. Um, so we do have some shared servers, meaning the UI points to not just the local server, but some other shared servers as well. Uh, we have a login service, which also is an HTTP um, uh, API. Um, we have help and videos, uh, which is sort of just a server that, that sits there and sort of serves these videos and things, so when people want to um, watch a video for how they ought to do something. Um, uh, it's available. Uh, this is sort of, we're trying this approach as sort of our answer to the how do you keep documentation up to date problem, uh, which I think is a, is a problem for, for not just us, but, but everybody. Um, and so we're trying to keep, we're trying to keep building this sort of library of videos um, that shows people how to use the tools. Uh, so we also have a feedback mechanism. So one of the thing, one of the lessons I think we took from web applications that are looking out, out there in that space um, is that it's really helpful to have a very very easy way to get feedback um, from people as they're using the tools. Traditionally, we had used DevTrack to put in bugs for everything, including tools and engine and, and game. Um, and while we still use DevTrack, um, we, what we did add was a very easy: just press this button, and you can put some text in and send some feedback to us. Um, and uh, we'll say would we easily get ten times the amount of, of issues reported uh, through this because it's sort of a one button one click kind of thing than uh, having to go through the DevTrack interface to submit bugs. The feedback the feedback system is sitting on another server. It's backed by Amazon SimpleDB, um, so it's stored offline in a separate database. Um, and to to a degree, pushing it into SimpleDB was really an experiment in SimpleDB. Um, and this is a lesson. Um, really, the takeaway from that is sort of find these bits and pieces of functionality that you can test web application, you know, various web application texts on that are fairly low risk. Um, so if something, you know, and in the process of learning Amazon SimpleDB, uh, if something were to happen, 
uh, the worst it could do in the scenario is take our feedback mechanism down, right? Um, so this gives us a nice sandbox to try things out on before we were to roll it out into a larger, uh, a larger area of the tools. Um, uh, we also have um, a, an a, we have, also have asset comments. So as you're browsing assets in the in the browser, um, you can it, you can basically add comments. Uh, really, um, this uh, the interface was taken from uh, the API interface for this was taken from um, Facebook Connect and or uh, Discus, sort of looking at their examples. Um, you know, and how that's managed. Basically, I created a server that's sort of very similar to to Discus in, in many ways, and just so we can attach comments to just about anything that can have a unique URL. Um, and in this case, so each asset can have its own set of comments. Um, getting people to use it is a whole other question, uh, but it's there. Uh, so a little bit of background. Um, so like, as I mentioned, we're using uh, Mongoose now for our local server. Um, but if we sort of step back in time when we started, uh, what we had built, what we started building was, uh, you know, we were looking at web tech at the time, sort of about two years ago, um, and we said, all right, well, one of the things that, you know, if we're pushing this direction, you know, maybe Flash is the way to go. So what we had built was a native application that you scale form uh, as, as sort of Flash UI. Uh, and uh, what, we, uh, what we found in that process was, that one, it was over, it was sort of overcomplicated for what we wanted to do, um, as well as we, because it was still a native application, we could still cheat the, um, you know, what data you were reading and transforming, uh, and uh, whether or not we really wanted to do that, it was still an, an inevitability that it would happen whenever there was a, um, a demo or something that we wanted to put together. Some somebody would always put, end up putting something in just sort of to cheat it and change the data somewhere, uh, and that uh, that we wanted to do something to sort of stop that from happening, you know, forever. Um, so after that, we moved to um, uh, a cut. We on, on the back end, we moved to a sort of a custom and totally integrated asset database. So this is all um, very custom um, in in memory, sort of file back system. Before we were using MongoDB, um, it was it was all there was a lot of generated code, um, and uh, it was. The disadvantage to this approach, what we found, it was uh, was somewhat difficult to maintain, um, but it was you know, it was more that uh, you know we we were dealing with all kinds of sort of database scalability problems that we could certainly solve, uh, but the question is really is this where we wanted to put our energy? Um, is this you know is this really where we would get the most benefit from solving this problem when you know there's quite a lot of technology out there that could help us, and so ultimately that's why we moved to to MongoDB. Um, we also had sort of a very traditional stack installed um, on the on our machines, um, so Apache, uh, MySQL. Um, what we found, uh, this is you know before we moved to Mongoose, what we found of that ultimately just the installation of Apache and MySQL on everybody's machine was extremely complicated and time consuming, um, and so we were doing a lot of support issues. Um, as well as just the sort of the sheer size of these things was unnecessary for, for what we wanted to do. The complexity was wasn't needed. Um, so moving to a much much smaller solution like Mongoose and MongoDB was much better for us. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, we're now storing RSDB in MongoDB. We have a build manager that looks for changes. Um, so right now uh, it's managed by sort of just looking for a change and rebuilding it. We also have we also have the ability to mark priority assets so that they get built first, um, and that's generally automatically managed. So if you're looking at an asset in the scene editor, it's marked as priority um, so that it gets built before anything else that might be building in the background. Um, but you, you know, when we started, we when we started this process, we had sort of the traditional on-demand builders. You know, you 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 request a build, it builds, it sort of finds the dependency and requests them to be built, um, and there was still sort of a lot of of of, of Individual management that had to be done, and we're asking people to do things to build to build stuff. Um, and what we really wanted was to make the build system totally invisible um, uh, as much as possible. Um, so uh, we started out with a some more sort of per type build service. So models had one builder, and and textures and materials maybe had a different builder. Um, and uh, um, and we tried using Incredibuild in particular to sort of build it, to sort of walk the dependency tree and build everything, all the assets. Uh, we found this to be uh, somewhat problematic uh, for two reasons. One was 
that uh, it doesn't support 64-bit executables in a distributed way. So uh, that pretty, was pretty much a problem right there. Um, uh, while they promised that support, it never actually materialized. Um, the second problem uh, was really just speed. Um, it takes increasingly longer to calculate dependencies, uh, and that became a problem for us. Um, there was a third sort of practical problem for programmers in that we found it wasn't. It should have been obvious in retrospect, but it wasn't. Uh, we, of course, found that you can't build assets and build code at the same time, so that became a problem. Um, uh, so now we have a custom build manager that handles that for us. Uh, so this is something that we build to sort of handle all of our dependencies, um, and this uh, runs in, you know in the in the in the uh, HTML code as well as sort of communicate with the database. Um, so the assets, just as some background, are built in multiple stages. Um, first stage, an asset gets built into a platform independent format. So this is all the sort of hard work that's shared across all platforms. Uh, can get calculated here and stored in a separate file. Um, so, for example, if you're building, a, you know, if you're building a model and you want to calculate binormals or something like that, um, uh, that can get stored here because that data is going to be shared across all the platforms. So, you know, the uh, after, as the file is built, it also exports its dependencies so that our database can see what things were needed in order to build it. Um, we have a distinction between hard dependencies and soft dependencies. Um, so hard dependencies are those things which have to be built before this thing is built. Um, and we really, really wanted to minimize this. Uh, this having hard dependencies slows down your iteration time, period. Um, so as much as possible, we have very, very few of them, which means ultimately that we are pushing towards soft dependencies, which means runtime linking, um, which, which of course is some, uh, some hopefully minimal, but certainly overhead at runtime, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to eat in order to um, link up assets. Um, but the difference in iteration time is tremendous. So it's, it's sort of an, an unavoidable consequence of really pushing toward uh, a higher iteration time. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, our scene editor is a, an actual plugin, a native plugin. Um, and literally, our plugin is just a plugin that will run any native application and jam it into a window inside the, br the browser. Um, and while that may be a security problem in real life, out there in the wild, uh, internally in the studio, it, you know, the security of our, our web application is really a non-issue. Uh, so we, could, we feel free to basically, in, in plugins, um, in the browser, we can feel free to sort of cheat all security issues. Um, um, and so having a sort of totally generic plugin that just will embed anything into a browser is fine. Um, it's technically, it's called a windowless plugin, just for those, of those that are curious. Um, it, al it allows us to run uh, the, scene, the scene editor, the 3D view, um, sort of asynchronously to what's happening in the browser. Uh, uh, the disadvantages, of course, is that sorting uh, with other things in the, in the, in the browser view um, is very difficult to do. Um, so conceptually, that 3D window, we, can, we consider it a very complex control it's both a server and a client, um, so it, you know, it is an HTTP server so that things can communicate with directly. This is to reduce the latency to get changes into there, um, but it's also a client in that it talks to the, the actual um, database server running on the machine to get information about changes of, uh, of assets while they're being viewed. Um, it keeps its own mirrored data state, so we have an asset, we have this, the the server that's running that keeps a state of all, all the assets and the things that you have loaded and, and what their changes are. Um, but the 3D scene editor also keeps a mirror data state of the thing that it's displaying. Um, the reason why is one, it is pushed, because it's a native engine, it's pushing into the native format, uh, but also we, to re, again to reduce the latency so that you know we can, uh, so we're not pushing sort of heavily pushing uh, data through this HTTP REST pipe. Um, so right now our UI, as I mentioned, is H HTML5 plus JavaScript and CSS3 mostly. Um, however, as I mentioned when we first started, we were running Flash uh, natively in, in the scale form. Um, uh, the first thing we moved to after that was pushing Flash into the browser because um, we wanted to do the data separation and push into the browser, so we left our Flash in there. Um, uh, the, the reason ultimately why we moved from Flash to, to HTML5 is that HTML5 is just way easier. Honestly, the tools are better, the, the debugging is better. Pretty much everything, everything about the experience of making UI in HTML5 and JavaScript is, is better than Flash. Um, 
Uh, initially, we had also looked at sort of the traditional web application model um, and had these very independent workflows. So, you know, we had, um, you know, what the animators were doing from a UI design was very different from, let's say, what our audio guys were doing or, or what the environment artists were doing, and we wanted to sort of optimize their workflows. Um, and uh, while I think that's something that we should continue to look at, um, we did step back from that quite a lot and moved back to a more, more traditional view. Um, one, it, we were, I think we were making too, too many changes all at once, um, and that was uncomfortable. Um, so uh, this allowed us to sort of keep some of the decisions, uh, not have to rethink some of the basic decisions that we have been familiar with uh, for years now, uh, while still sort of pushing the technology forward. Um, so now we do have much more combined traditional workflows. It's certainly not perfect, um, uh, but one of the big sort of the, one of the big things that we've done as part of this process is to have usability testing commonly. Uh, we are constantly doing usability testing on the tools, which means that we sit down with somebody, watch them work, and take notes. Um, uh, we have done for, sort of a lot more formal usability testing where we'll, we'll get in a group and we'll watch somebody work in, in a separate room. Um, I, I think nothing, virtually nothing has changed our process more than um, sitting down and doing actual usability testing with, uh, with people who actually use these tools um, in, a practical, in a practical way. Um, uh, as far as the UI controls go, they're pretty much all custom. Uh, we use we do use jQuery, um, and I think that I mean jQuery is pretty cool. I I, um, I don't know that I would want to use honestly would want to use JavaScript in in a browser without it. Um, but uh, we don't use anything like jQuery UI or or um, ext4 or any of the other sort of common UI control stuff. Uh, pretty much everything is custom. We we at the end of the day, we've just found that uh, we have custom needs. Everything that we do, there's some custom need to it, and so we end up making our our own custom controls for everything. Um, uh, so I want to share some of the sort of surprisingly hard questions that came up that you would not have thought were were complicated. Um, files and naming them um, in a traditional application. This was a, this was largely a non-issue. You know, you were dealing with files, you open them, you name them, and you save them. Um, but in a web application, this, you know, you, when you're trying to minimize the, the amount of steps it takes to do something, um, a lot of the things uh, are sort of questions sort of, and things, some things are stored in a database. It's a question of how do you name this stuff? Where is it stored? Who has control over it? Um, and this is, this is continuing to be a complicated question for us. <coughs> Um, you know, do you deal with the file system? Do you, as a, <clears throat> when you're using the tools, do you deal with the file system? If I say I want to create a new te texture, does it literally open a file, open a browser, and you have to work on your your own local system to find the location of that in order to, to tell a web application? Um, it's sort of a mixed model, um, and, it, and it turns out to be much more complicated than than it would at first seem. Um, autosave um, turned out we initially thought that autosave would be a good thing and uh, would be the way to go, as also sort of fairly typical. Uh, web application model. Um, turns out that that shakes up quite a lot of people's workflows um, uh, and sort of just in watching people work um, and how much they how much they worked on um, sort of unsaved data just to test it out um, and auto saving um, especially in a in sort of live database where where they would see live only for them but they would see those changes on you know come showing up in the in the, the game view while they're editing um, turned out to be disconcerting for some people. So uh, we moved back to a more traditional manual save model, um, but I think this is something that we do need to revisit. Um, so the outliner um, turned out to be much more complicated, continues to be complicated. Um, one, this really comes from usability testing, and we've, we found it very difficult to find good reasons for it to exist. Um, although since we found a few use cases, um, it's largely just another view into the scene data, right? A sort of flat view into the scene data, um, and just being able to organize that properly and and in a way and present it in a way that's really really useful has been complicated. Um, pan and zoom controls when you have an integrated system turn out to be more complicated than you'd anticipate. Some people are used to. Um, so when we're showing two sets of controls on the same screen in the same browser. Um, where normally those would have, might have been two separate native windows, um, uh, you you have a tendency to want one way or another. So if you're in a if you're used to a 2D 
um, sort of two D pen and scrolling application, um, you expect pen and zoom to work one way with sort of the mouse clicks and the and, and the alt key and stuff like that. But if you use to Maya, you expect it to work a different way. And having both of those on the same screen uh, leads to some frustration from people. Um, we ended up sort of going to more of the Maya based style, Maya style. Um, panel layouts turned to be turned out to be a major concern of sort of how people arrange their panels and where, what screens they want to put down, how many screens people have. Um, turned out to be very complicated when dealing with the browser. Um, uh, the language of things sort of part of this process of changing is changing, you know, what terms we use for everything. And uh, of course, that's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, uh, sort of prefabs, um, it, prefabs turn out to be a complicated problem. And this comes from sort of our revision control culture. It doesn't seem like they would be related. Uh, but when you have some, when you want something like a pre, the obvious thing would be like I want a light that's inside of a prefab that also has like a lamp, right? So both those things are in the same prefab. Um, but just the way our sort of mission control culture works and our, our studio culture works is so the people that want to deal with lighting are independent of the people who would want to deal with the model of that lamp. Um, and while it, you know, and so it's very complicated now. It's very complicated to check out that one thing between them if they both want to work on it at the same time, um, where previously those would just be in separate layers. Um, Cross-site scripting uh, was a giant pain in the ass, honestly. Um, this is sort of the back to the security model. Um, so we wanted to talk to all these server servers from the web application. And uh, uh, of course, the browsers are intended to stop you from, from doing this for security reasons. Um, so ultimately, we just ended up sort of proxying things through our uh, the server on, on the machine uh, if we need it. Uh, but it still turned out to be more painful than we expected. Uh, installer, getting the stuff installed on people's machines, getting, you know, it's it's not just sort of in the typical, it's not just a typical web application, right, getting getting some updated um, page on people's machine, but we have a server to install, we have a database to install, we have that the plugin to install, um, multiple sort of Chrome plugins as well, um, so just managing the install process has continued to be uh, a pain in the butt. Um, and uh, you know, looking at all the sort of custom installers out there, really wish somebody would solve this issue, honestly. Um, Asset Tracker turned out to be a big pain in the butt. Um, NTFS Journal, so of course it's NTFS only. Um, uh, plugin, um, so uh, handling keyboard, mouse, um, uh, in, the, in the 3D plugin, uh, independent in what the focus is, you know, when it's embedded, um, the focus, so the focus rules are less clear. So, uh, you know, is it on mouse over? Does the thing get focused or do you have to actually click on it? Um, the draw order, as I mentioned, sorting with other things in the HTML view. Um, undo, redo, of course, is always more complicated than you expect it to be. Um, we've done, since, you know, since we've sort of moved to the asset database, Mongo database, um, this is really, you know, one of the driving reasons to do that was to be able to push a list of all the changes and their, the reversals into the database um, so that we have sort of a uniform undo, redo sort of stored in this JSON format um, that can we just apply to the data as you undo. Um, uh, let's see if we can get that video to run. All right, or not. No problem. Um, so some quick tips. YouTube is bringing down my machine. Oh, awesome. Um, all right. So um, one of the things that we did, I think we did wrong initially, was how do how do you manage asserts in a web application with a web server and stuff like that, uh, and that's something we're still struggling with. You know, of course, you don't want to bring the server down for any reason. Um, so having having a process of making sure that you can gracefully shut down parts of the system and restart them has been a big part of uh, of our learning process. Um, uh, so we treated initially treated JavaScript like scripting conceptually, uh, meaning not like real programming, right? Uh, and uh, that turned out to be a big mistake, of course, because as we pushed more and more sort of logic and functionality into JavaScript, uh, it just became more and more a big giant mess. Um, uh, again, you know, I think initially we treated the whole system as too monolithic. 
um, since we've moved since then we moved to parts that can be brought down and brought back up independently um, but it really needs to be built to fail so if something goes down you have to be able to leave the rest of the system up and just bring that part back up um, or every the entire system the entire any kind of web application would be um, un, unworkable um, uh, one of the things that we really didn't do right from the beginning um, and that we're trying to fix now is that we didn't gather any metrics. I mean, this was an obvious thing um, that we really should have done. Is sort of what what are people really doing in the application? What things are they clicking on? What are they what what are they using? What assets are they choosing? How long does it take them? Whatever. Um, all the metrics that we would consider um, for a game, we should also consider for our tools. Um, uh, another real huge penalty that we've been paying, real pain in the butt that we've been paying is that we, never, we didn't have any kind of login. We didn't expect to be able to log in. Um, this comes from sort of our history of, of native, building native tools, um, but not knowing who it is um, has, has turned into, when, when something goes wrong, has turned into a big pain for a lot of, for a lot of things. Um, so we end up having to ask people, okay, put in your name or your email address or just whatever here, um, rather than having a sort of a uniform login that everyone can use. Um, handling window arrangement in the tools has continuously been an issue. Um, uh, uh, performance, um, uh, of course, you know, the performance is of course and always an issue. This is something that uh, we we should we should have known better. Um, we re, you know we're looking at the for the performance of um, um, the performance implications of our REST API and we've paid the price for some of that. Uh, but it's something you really have to cons consider carefully when you when you design your API in the first place. Uh, just like anything else, uh, you know where there's one, there's more than one. So you want to by default sort of look at the data flow of, of what you're requesting and how much you're requesting and how many requests that that would need in order in a typical case. You know certainly if you select 10,000 objects in your scene, what would happen, right? Hopefully it's just one you know one packet that says I selected 10,000 ob you know 10,000 things. Here's the range and the server can figure it out. Um, uh, so uh, what we didn't uh, we didn't manage our assets uniformly in the back end in the server. Uh, so each asset was handled in a separate each asset type was handled in a separate way. While they were all they were while they were all stored in sort of a JSON description, um, they were managed independently. <coughs> so the server had to have a sort of separate code for each type of asset. Where since then we moved to a, a much more uniform management um, that just handles handles the assets all as one kind of one type. Um, one of the things we did write, uh, I think, is, is picking jQuery for our JavaScript code. Uh, it certainly simplified things. Um, uh, I think uh, one, also one of the things that we did right from the beginning was to handle all of our data management in JavaScript. Um, even when we were using Flash, um, all of, sort of all the data coming in, we, ha we managed in JavaScript in JSON, and then we pushed it to the Flash. Uh, uh, to the Flash plugin, rather than sort of having Flash directly go out and talk talk to things, uh, that's greatly simplified. Uh, that greatly simplified our lives at that time, and it's continued to benefit us just sort of managing things in, in directly in JSON and in JavaScript. It's also a very easy to edit format, so uh, it's hard to go wrong with, with JSON, and certainly better than XML, which is shit. Um, uh, as I mentioned, usability testing has been been huge benefit to us. There's been very little that's benefited us more than this. Um, so the other things that we did right, we picked a browser um, and we stuck with it. Um, we're not trying to be on every browser in every case and everywhere. Um, we picked WebKit. You know, it's technology which we're learning um, and we want to understand really well. You know, if we're using tools, we want to understand them. We want to know how they work and we want to know how they work under the hood. So um, picking picking a toolkit that we could, you know, look at the code and understand it was was beneficial. Um, making Chrome in particular, sort of looking at what Google's doing with web sockets and, and WebGL in particular and make potential benefits to us there, um, uh, I think was a good choice. Um, as I mentioned, using JSON as an exchange format was the right, right decision for us. Um, we also have a, sort of a DDL, a data description language uh, and compiler that we created, uh, which, uh, uses, which uses a uh, um, JSON-like format for serialization uh, and will also generate generate code for the native code um, uh, to describe any kind of structure and how to edit that structure and manage it. Um, so this is a, opposed to reflection, let's say. So this generates code rather than having a, um, a general reflection system uh, like we used to in the old tools. It's considerably faster and much more straightforward. Um, 
as I mentioned, one of the things we definitely did right was to add a feedback button to the tools. Um, uh, I'd sort of a tip that I have is sort of did, oh, whenever you create an API um, for for your server or whatever, just always always demo it or or test it against alternative clients, not just in the browser, but write write command line scripts and other things on other machines that that edit that data in some way, because um, otherwise you're going, going to end up running into the browser in particular. Um, and uh, there's all there's huge advantages to being able to write offline scripts that talk directly to the server and and can edit the data. Um, uh, so you know the obvious thing is that the the user experience and deciding on the best user experience depends on what is obvious the user's experience. Um, so you know the choices that we make and you know as we're looking to sort of how people work are going to be different than we would make for a different group of people, and it's largely based on the culture that we have at the studio. Um, and I, I think that's an important thing to remember that that you know as you build tools. Um, they, as you build anything, right, it's, you're reflecting sort of the culture that you're in, um, and you simply can't just jam in the choices that another culture has made into, you know, your studio. Um, it's not going to work. There's just things that aren't just going to fly or that won't make sense for people. Um, uh, Server-side scripting um, is totally seamless. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, look for other ways of using um, you know, you have the machine, you have access to the data, look for other, other ways to sort of call scripts that do work or call native code that does work with the, the backend data. Um, but that all, the advantage of sort of server-side scripting is that these, these commands are sort of brought up as processes and brought down um, on demand, uh, which means that if any one of them fails, it's not going to bring the whole system down with it as it might have traditionally. Um, uh, uh, one tip is definitely work out the asset API first. Sort of how, what do assets look like? How do you access them? Um, uh, how do you save them? How do you edit them? How do you whatever? All that stuff. Um, how do you check them in the reports? All that stuff. Work out first because everything, everything is sort of built on top of that. Um, and so we've had to change that multiple times during our process, and it's really just shook up, um, taking quite a lot of work to back out of, of a previous change. Um, so the typical things: create, edit, delete, rename. Uh, Reverse control, oh, how the OS manages it. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there's no universal user experience. There's nothing that you, you know. You're never going to be able to build something, web application or otherwise, um, that works perfectly for everyone. You know, so focus on the culture that you have and the people that you have and how that works. Um, I would recommend you just skip Flash if you're thinking about it. Just go straight to HTML5. It's, it's, it's plenty workable. It's still rough around the edges, but it's, it's plenty workable. Um, so would I do it again? Absolutely, I think we'd do it again. I think we'd, we'd obviously do it better, and I think we're continuing to do it better. Um, but I, I think it's, like, as I mentioned, I think it's an inevitability. I think it's the direction things are going, and uh, we'd totally do it. Um, if you want to contact me, um, you can get me on Twitter. You can email me, whatever. Um, let me try one more time to get this video and uh, see how it goes. I have a few videos available um, on YouTube. I'll send out those links. Uh, but, it's, you know, as you can see, it sort of looks uh, like, you know, it's, it looks a fairly normal application, but this is all running in the browser. Um, and uh, all these panels over here will collapse, and, you know, these are all custom controls that manage very custom things for, for our tools. Um, different pages, you can, you know, one of the advantages is you can pop up two different tabs, let's say, and have two different views into two different things, um, and maybe split those into two browser windows and, and edit two things at the same time, all that you'd sort of expect in a, in a browser uh, interface. Uh, so with that, um, uh, Wolfgang, do we have any questions out there? Uh, yes, we do. And um, I would just go now through those questions. I send it to you first, and then I'm reading it out loud. So, first question is, how long did the transition from previous tools to your web-based develop, development tools take, and how difficult was the transition? Thanks. I would say that we're still in the transition. Um, I mean, we've been doing this for a couple of years now, um, and I think that we're, we're still in the transition. Uh, we're going, you know, production has moved into using these new tools. We are uh, 
we're still learning sort of the best way of building them. Uh, it's still very much first generation of them. Um, and in some ways, yeah, it was difficult. In some ways, it's a huge change in how you work. Um, but the hope is, and I, I think this is true even currently, is that it's still, there's still plenty that's better. Um, there's still plenty that immediately is better than it was before and a little bit easier than it was before. So that the, the things that are painful um, or still not sort of quite, quite as mature as the previous set um, are a little bit mitigated. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is, the transition is just going to take a while. Um, but I don't think you can avoid that. I don't think you can say, well, we're not going to do it unless the transition is, is costs us nothing. Um, because this is just not going to happen, right? Um, I see a couple other questions here, Wolfgang. I'm just going to jump into them. Okay. Um, so, uh, Lewis asks, what's the benefit of developing tools in browser rather than bringing the web to your engine? For example, the awesome frame, os, os, what is this? Awesome, awesomium framework lets you integrate web UI into your game engine. Um, well, I mean, as I mentioned, I think that the main, one of the main advantages is that uh, you sort of, you, you split the, the data transforms you force the issue where you don't have native access to to the back end data, so that your UI must concentrate on UI. However, I mean, if you you have a super disciplined team, you can do um, you can pretty much anything's going to work, right? <coughs> the other advantage, of course, of having it in a browser is that people who are used to making things in the browser, making tools, making you know JavaScript, and making those changes can just use those tools, right? There's cool, there's really good JavaScript debuggers and things in the browser, in Chrome. You can just use that. Um, you don't have to create a whole new suite of tools uh, when the sort of the suite of tools for web application developers is, is getting better and better every day. Um, so we would be, uh, uh, it would probably be a poor decision for us not to take advantage of that. Uh, so the next question is, um, do you think this will allow devs to work off-site on occasion, or are they already? Um, honestly, uh, I don't think that makes any, any practical difference. Uh, as far as our sort of off-site devs, they could have installed the native tools before, um, and they can, they can certainly do these tools now. Uh, so, so while the answer is yes, I don't think that it has made any practical difference, because they could do that before. Um, what is the benefit of developing the tool? No, sorry, I hit that one. What technology are you using to Enter the scene in the browser um, for the editor are using WebGL. Now, as I mentioned, this is that, that in browser 3D view it is our native engine running in a plugin. Um, so it's it's all that is native, absolutely native code, um, and just plugged into the browser. Um, uh, web one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was making sure that the view that they saw in there was the in engine view. That, that it sort of really is sort of what you see is what you get as much as possible um, when you're crossing PC and console. Um, but WebGL would be way, way too far off from what you would see in console. And the performance of it, it wouldn't, wouldn't be quite what we were looking for. Um, although I think that that may change in the future. So it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, how much does your work data flow change when the game is running on the console target? Do you connect to the web app plugin to the target? Um, yeah, that's something we're working on now. But, uh, but yeah, basically you can launch the console, you can launch the console target um, directly from the web application. So you're running the game. Um, the game is then a web client and can see the server um, and can get changes to the, the asset data directly. Um, so uh, it, the workflow is uh, hopefully similar. Um, do you have issues with auto-updating nature of Chrome? Not so far, honestly. It hasn't really been an issue so far. Um, have you considered going the other way and embedding WebKit? No, it's the same question, really. Um, if I understand it correctly, the user installs a local web server DB. How much of the tool chain is located on a central server versus a local server uh, the users have to install? Is a full centralized server an option? Um, so yes, uh, um, it's it's generally installed on the asset database is generally local to the user. Um, you could in you could in principle move to a central server. That's not a practical problem. Um, it's really a cultural choice. Um, one of the things that we sort of culturally have built on is the idea that people can be on very different versions of the asset data, very different versions of the game. They can sync from the Perforce database when they like, how they like individual assets, however they like, they can check in different things as they like, which means that virtually everybody's view is all, always different. Um, however, if your sort of studio culture is much more of a live view where everybody's editing the same thing and wants to see changes um, as other people are editing, <coughs> and sort of deal with the ramifications of that, um, which is largely sort of you have to deal with more stability problems and stuff like that, then I think a central 
central server is totally feasible. Um, there's a little going to be a little more, more latency. We certainly have uh, the advantage of all, you know very small latency on a local server, um, but I don't think it's I don't think it's something that is impossible to uh, to solve. Um, do you use native clients uh, for anything? Maybe the engine plugin used on Scene Editor. If not, are there plans to use it in the future? Uh, I'm really, really super intrigued by native client. Um, I think there's some potential there, but no, our native code is literally just native code that we run. Um, but uh, and part of it is that you know, with we're run because we're running the engine in the native code to, to display the 3D scene, we need actual we need to be able to actually run. Um, uh, in Windows, we need to actually run DirectX 11, um, and we're somewhat limited in native client to to the um, OpenGL yes. But uh, but no, it's super intriguing, and I think there's lots of cool things that we could potentially do with native client. We just haven't got there yet. Have you considered dropping the native plugin and making use of a WebGL based 3D editor? Okay, I kind of answered that, but the answer it really is no, because it's not that's not what we're tr what we're trying to accomplish is uh, is really showing showing the artist what they would see. Um, where is the divide between engine and UI? For example, who handles the selection, movement, widgets, translation, rotation, etc.? Um, uh, so uh, it's the division. You know, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? So if, the, if there is a, if there's something in the in the HTML view of the scene, like maybe a slider that changes something, um, that's going to generate messages that are going to send to the server to say, oh yeah, you changed this color, um, and then the server is going to tell the uh, 3D view that this color on this asset, which we may have seen, changes. However, in the scene editor, in the 3D view, um, that is a very complex, we consider a very complex control. So all the, the sort of the widgets inside the scene editor, like rotation, translation, or stuff, are handled locally to that scene editor. Um, so you just move and translate the object or rotate it or whatever locally in the scene editor. And then it will message out to the, to, to the uh, server and say, OK, I changed this guy locally. Um, and then the UI can get that message and ultimately get that message and reflect the change in the in the uh, HTML UI. I hope that answers your question. Um, do you use your DDL to describe runtime structs, or is it strictly primary for structs that hold the serialized structure? No, we definitely use it for runtime structs. Um, so DDL is really a, a sort of a very cool system for us. Um, and that we have this sort of um, very we have ability to describe structs in, in a um, custom format. Um, and we run the compiler, or we have a series of sort of custom compilers that run on that um, that can generate code and generate runtime structs. Um, we have we can generate structs that are specifically for tools that have more um, functionality for things like serialization um, and dynamic memory, uh, more dynamic memory. We're not really big on dynamic memory, but let's say, let's call it slightly more dynamic memory. Um, uh, where the runtime structs for for the the game are maybe a little more trimmed down, uh, but we certainly use DDL for for uh, describing runtime stuff. Um, how do you deploy updates to the 3D plugin? Um, so this is part of the sort of install problem, as I mentioned. <coughs> um, uh, we basically have a full installer that we send out, uh, and that will include plugin changes. Uh, we have so we have the three we have the 3D plugin. We have the server that can change. Uh, we also have we have actual plugins into Chrome, um, uh, um, extend Chrome extensions that that we can we can update because uh, we have custom Chrome menus and stuff like that. So all that comes in a, in a sort of traditional installer package that people put in and update what they have. Um, how many people are dedicated to build the tools exclusively? Um, so uh, that's a hard question to answer because we don't we're not we don't have the division between sort of tools and and runtime. Um, so and we have an engine team that handles everything, right? All the all of the tools, all of the runtime, um, engine stuff, um, and so we're not strictly divided between it. Um, but we have about 20 people on the team total, um, and uh, so you know I think everybody does a little bit of, of tool stuff for sure. Um, we do have one one person that's totally dedicated to to UI uh, JavaScript stuff, um, and we do have one um, uh, usability. Um, one usability guy who's pretty much just dedicated to usability issues and and, uh, and working on that. So um, everybody else is some mix. Uh, can you elaborate on the DDL plus code gen part? Uh, that was the alternative to reflection. Um, so as I, as I'm not sure how to elaborate on that. Um, so you write you. You open it, it's a text file, you open it up, it describes a structure. Um, that structure has fields, the fields have markup. Um, so you can say, you know, 
Um, you can mark up the fields in various different ways to say um, this, you know, this is sort of the, U, the display name of this field for UI or um, some other markup that might say um, this, you know, this field should be used in this way at runtime or whatever. Anyway, there's lots of different markup for different fields that, that are, can be customized. Um, so it's pretty much just a structured description language, right, with lots of different custom markup. Um, and uh, we, we have compilers that we wrote that will take that description and compile it into multiple different things. One is native source, the native structure that represents that. Two is a JSON description of that same thing. And three is sort of a JSON serialized format. So the code, the native code, will load and save the JSON serialized format that gets generated by this compiler. Um, and then the tools, the web application tools, can read and load this JSON serialized format um, natively um, or as close to native as you get when you're talking about JavaScript. Uh, so it's really this sort of it is sort of central to our whole system. Um, uh, do you have any tips on selling idea web apps to production management? It seems like it might be difficult to justify the large development costs when there already exists a native toolkit that already works. Um, I mean, uh, honestly, um, I don't really because uh, I mean this was I think it's just a decision that we felt we had to make. Um, it, the writing is. Uh, like I said, the writing is on the wall for for cost and growth of the industry and sort of where things are going. Um, so if you can't justify it through the various things that I mentioned, that it's you know potentially cheaper to develop, that there's things that you can take advantage of that uh, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do, um, that you know the expectations of, of people in general and certainly the developers that are coming um, on board now are that this is the world that they work in and they expect to be able to ha integrate everything that you do into all these other tools, um, if you can't sort of justify it based on reality, then I don't have any other tips for you, right? Because this is sort of, um, ultimately, it's it's a choice of where do you want to be, right? Do you want to be in the past or do you want to be in the future? Um, uh, can you monitor and interact with an engine instance running on a console target from the tool? Um, so this, pause, debug, etc. So uh, this is something that, um, that we we want to play with quite a lot, and this is a um, uh, this is a sort of entirely separate subject, um, which is really about taking the game engine and also having a server running on the game engine. Um, and so it would be um, game as you know, game as a web server, right? Um, and there's lots and lots of potential there. Lots of things you can do there. Um, uh, and so in, I think we've had some discussions on Alt Dev Blog Day about it, and you can find some of the uh, um, articles on there, but there's so much that you can do by putting a web server into your your tools um, and having the GUI, the sort of having the, the GUI in your um, browser. Um, uh, but I think that's an independent, separate discussion. 